tuning in. This week on the show, peak time NBN speeds could be getting two to 300 megabits in speed with new gigabit NBN speed plans available soon. Plus, Arlo is making your home more secure. Samsung's got a new smartphone in the mid-market space. There's a new tablet around. Plus, we'll answer your questions. <music> In Tech News this week, we thought we'd talk about one particular topic that many of you have been discussing more regularly over the last few months at least. The idea that software updates for your Android smartphone, how long should they be? Over the last few years, we've noticed that Android hardware has gone up in price. So has Apple hardware the, with the iPhone. It's no longer the $1,000 phone or $1,500 phone. It's between $1,500 and $2,000 that you're paying for a premium Android smartphone. Now, that price gives you a device which is chock full of amazing hardware, fantastic camera, um, battery technology, circuitry board technology, um, the ability to do all sorts of different things with your smartphone and throw in there 5G speeds as well with some brands. But one of the things we haven't seen uh, grow is the length of time that manufacturers are providing ongoing software update support. Now, we're not talking about patching the smartphone per se, which is what should be going on every, every month for a smartphone. Every month when Google put out their updates uh, for the Android, the security updates that close those security holes, your manufacturer, through a set period of time, will be passing on those updates to your handset so it can be patched and secured from those vulnerabilities. We're talking about if you buy a smartphone with version 10 of Android and then the next year, the manufacturer will update it for you to version 11 via over-the-air update. Then the next year, they'll update it for you again to Android 12 via an over-the-air update. The benefit is, through those updates, you get the new enhanced software features that Google is putting into their latest operating system. Now, the question is, why would it stop at that point? Why wouldn't it continue? Android 13, maybe even Android 14. When you look at an Apple device with iOS, the update path for iOS software is longer than just two years. Now it's not infinite, we know that. We know that and that's okay. But it is longer than just that two year period and many of you have started to notice, well hang on a second, why is this going on with Android devices? Why isn't the path longer? It should be longer if we are dropping 1500 and by this amount we're talking Australian dollars here, $1,500 to $2,000 on a handset. They're not dying at the end of two years anymore because we're doing things like uh, we're, we're taking cases and all those kinds of things and wrapping them around our smartphones so they're being protected for longer periods of time. So why isn't the operating system, the updated operating system being provided to you as a customer? That's something we're gonna be looking at over the coming weeks and months here on CyberShack and it's something that many of you have been talking about in your various blogs and social media posts and we're gonna ask that of the manufacturers here on the show. Let's talk about internet across the country, the National Broadband Network, one of the retailers has just come out, uh, Aussie Broadband, and announced that they are doing a gigabit internet service. Gigabit is a thousand megabit, uh, and it offers people the ability, depending on the NBN uh, method of technology that they connect to the network, faster speeds than ever before. And I thought we'd have a chat with the managing director of Aussie Broadband, the retailer that has made this announcement, Philip Britt. How are you, Philip? Yeah, good day. How are you going? Look, I want to talk to you about this gigabit service first and foremost. It's not for everybody, is it? It depends on your internet connection or your method of connecting to the NBN. Yeah, certainly the method is a big thing. So if you're on fibre to the premises services, then you'll be able to get it without any issues. Um, if you're on the NBN HFC network, then only a certain number of premises will be available day one, and then that will grow over time. And if you're on any of the other technologies, it's not available at this point. 
The HFC network, it, when you say it grows over time, are we seeing very small pockets available now or in the coming weeks, but you expect it to take years, or are we talking about a number of months and then everyone on HFC would be able to have it? How quickly is the rollout of that? Look, we're expecting the rollout's going to um, to happen over the next sort of 12, 18 months, and it, it comes down to NBN has to upgrade some of the, um, the technology that's in the HFC network. Um, mm. it's, it's a thing called Doxis and basically that, that has to go to the new version to enable it. Once we go gigabit, it doesn't guarantee that our throughput speed are going to be gigabit speeds, does it? It depends on congestion on the network, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Congestion on the network is certainly part of it. Um, it's how much bandwidth your retail service provider provisions and ultimately, um, this is a what we're talking about with residential type services. This is a, a best effort service. So speeds will vary, um, particularly in the peak periods and, and the product that we're bringing to market. Uh, we're sort of saying um, we'll, we'll, put, we'll back at least two to 300 meg in the evening uh, sort of thing. But uh, mm -hmm. you'll be able to see the full speeds outside of that off peak period. Talking about evening congestion, we must have seen the largest amount of evening congestion across the NBN during the lockdown period ever before. Is that replicated in what you've seen? Absolutely. The The evening uh, period has grown by up to 40% during the, the lockdown period. And what's enabled the network to keep going is ultimately NBN has provided retail providers with an extra 40% of capacity at no cost, which means that uh, virtually all providers have been able to pass that onto the network. And that's meant that things really haven't slowed down, apart from the odd game update here and then the, the COD updates really slammed the network. Um, but uh, no, it's been performing really well during lockdown, even with that 40% increase in traffic. Have you noticed congestion dropping away over the last few weeks? As NBN has reported it, they've come out and said that those peak time speeds especially have dropped away since the peak. Uh, uh, consumption point. Have you noticed that too? Absolutely. We've seen that play out. And as people have started to move about the community again, have been able to gather sort of thing, we've seen that, that, that dip off. The daytime traffic has stayed relatively similar because uh, I think the majority of people are still working from home that can work from home. Um, but that evening peak, I think pretty much everyone did their, their Netflix binge or downloaded the whole internet during those first few weeks. And then it's, uh, it's sort of balanced out from there. We, we still get plenty of NBN complaints. Um, I, I will admit that when I send my radio listeners uh, of my radio show to uh, Aussie Broadband, I very rarely hear back from them with any kind of complaint. Um, either those are directed to your local call centre or, or they just don't have them at all. But when we hear about NBN complaints, anecdotally for me, I hear mainly about the fibre to the node solution uh, of NBN. Is that replicated in the data that you see from your customers? Look, we see we do see fiber to the node um, issues there, and it, it's a combination of usually in-house wiring plays a big part in that. Um, sometimes in the street where water gets into joints and things like that and can affect performance. But probably more recently, we've been seeing um, uh, upstream speed complaints in the HFC uh, network, and, and that's sort of been brought about by a lot of people doing the work from home, a lot more video from home. Um, and there are some segments of HFC which are under pressure at the moment. So when you talk about congestion uh, on the HFC, I, I don't understand how customers continue to misunderstand how not all NBN providers are the same. I mean, can you explain as clearly as you can how each different retailer it has different options around providing speed options for their customers. Yeah, absolutely. So each different provider has a pipe into NBN. And if you think of it like a water pipe, um, they can govern the size um, of that pipe and they make a conscious choice. It's a commercial decision how big that pipe is. And ultimately they, um, they provision what they feel is the appropriate amount of bandwidth that might be to to meet the speeds or it might be to meet a commercial requirement and our philosophy has always been about provisioning the, the right amount of bandwidth um, at the time there'll be some times that we get caught out by a game update or that but in general we have spare capacity sitting around and that spare capacity ultimately costs money whereas other providers might provision a lower amount 
and then ultimately um, their, their customers might suffer some congestion as a result. The area of congestion, I mean, that's the bit that people complain about, don't they? Because they, they then go out and say, oh, the NBN's rubbish. But quite often just changing retailers is the actual solution that they need to follow. That, that's correct. And if we step back probably um, 18 months ago, um, before NBN made some changes to its commercial constructs, there were a lot of providers not provisioning enough bandwidth and, and big major providers. And so people thought the NBN was rubbish because um, it was it was slower than their existing services. Um, but a few people had swapped across to us and going, well, actually, um, when I change, I see a big difference. It's becoming less of an issue now because of the commercial constructs NBN has. So providers generally provision a reasonable amount. Um, but ultimately, there are still differences out there that we see and, and people changing providers because of speed and then seeing an uplift as a result. Philip, you and I have one similarity um, with our internet. I, I did home uh, renovations in the form of digging a trench and laying my own conduit up to the street to get fixed line internet, which then allowed the NBN to, to follow a path down to my house when it was ready to be installed. You also did some changes at your end as well to move from a fixed uh, wireless solution to a fixed line solution. Um, do you recommend to homeowners that if their internet isn't quite up to scratch, be it the technology that they're using, that they then go on a path of explore, exploring changes that they can do themselves? Yeah, so there's a few options to, um, I guess, homeowners, um, if, they're, if they're not on the technology that's going to work for them. Um, there's the technology change programs where NBN will consider changing um, the technology that um, uh, that's to the premises and, and the, for the homeowner has to pay for that as a as an upgrade path, but you can upgrade and swap into fiber to the premises um, at a fee with NBN. Um, mm. The path I took myself was a little bit more drastic than that. I, I have an estate that's about 300 meters away from me that's fiber to the premises. And one of our software developers lives there. And so he's got fiber to the premises. And so I come off a separate port on his via a, a private wireless link. And, and that's how I get my internet. Um, and obviously it's improved things We've, we've had an excellent communication with you today um, through the video. Um, for people who continue to have challenges with the NBN, what's your number one piece of advice that they can follow to improve things that's going to have an immediate effect or, or, short, or a close to immediate effect for them? Look, the, the thing that they should be doing is talking to their retail service provider and not taking no for an answer. If, um, if they believe that there's something wrong, um, I guess some of the tenancy with with NBN faults is that um, they they may get closed automatically, and there's a lot of um, I guess uh, robots running around in NBN's fault system. So that's basically automated processes that if if a fault doesn't tick a particular box, then it just gets closed. And so that can be quite frustrating for service providers, but also for customers alike. And so if something's not right, keep escalating it with your service provider. Every service provider has to have a complaints department. Um, and ultimately, you can request to be um, have your case heard by the complaints department, and they'll normally have the escalation channels in with NBN that can can get these issues resolved. All right, it's the internet service provider with a local based call center that is provisioning enough bandwidth from the NBN, that is providing good customer support, that is providing fair prices, and that is providing. Uh, uh, consistently good peak time speeds. They are Aussie broadband. They are bringing out gigabit fiber to the home speeds and HFC speeds once the network is up and running. Cost you about 150 bucks. We'll put details on the website. Philip Britt, Managing Director, thank you for your time today and uh, best of luck with your business. You guys are doing really well. Awesome. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah. If you're looking for a security camera with high image quality, a rugged design and packed with features, the Arlo Pro 3 might just be for you. Arlo has recently improved its high-end Pro 3 lineup by adding Apple HomeKit functionality to it, enabling voice control via Siri. Hey Siri, show me front door camera. With excellent image quality, colour night vision and a 160 degree field of view, Arlo Pro 3 is an easy way to secure your home. An added bonus to the Arlo Pro 3 is the integrated spotlight. Either activate it manually when you need a bit more light to see what's going on, or set it to turn on automatically when the camera detects motion. 
Now in the show, it's time to talk with a friend of the show, Jeff Quattromani, tech expert. Uh, Jeff, beginning of the show, question without notice, we spoke with Philip mm-hmm. Britt, Managing Director, Aussie Broadband, about their new gigabit plan. You're on fibre to the home. Are you going to upgrade to gigabit speed? Look, I think in, from my point of view, it's hard to justify going to gigabit. I'm on the 100 meg plan, and honestly, mm. it's like electricity already. When I when I go to a website, it's like flicking that light switch. It comes on instantly. Mm. So to go to gigabit, will it give me more and will I notice it? Probably not in my situation, and maybe not yet, I think would be the best mm. answer. Mm. But if you look, if you're a family of six, then uh, definitely be something of interest so for that extra 50 bucks or so, the premium price you're going to pay. Uh, most certainly something that some people other um, than you, you know, um, husband, wife, young child in a, in a home would be interested in though. So um, worth looking at. Exactly. I mean, my, my, um, little, my, my, my little Alexander's only one year old, so uh, he's not using much bandwidth at the moment. Very good. Now let's talk about Samsung's brand new A-series. This is a giant phone, the A71. Look, it's a, it's a 6.7 inch display. So it is quite a larger screen. Um, and to be honest, this is the kind of device that I'm starting to lean towards, uh, Charlie. This is probably a bit surprising for me is that as we've gone on, we've, we've always focused on flagship smartphones. And here is one that comes in at 749 that honestly has most of the capabilities that we should be expecting from a new phone today. So you start to challenge yourself and ask, why would I spend twice the amount on a brand new smartphone? Well, why would you? I mean, I'm going to take a punt that I haven't looked at the specs, but I'm going to guess that this isn't 5G enabled, right? It's 4G handset. But why would you spend that extra money? What's the net benefit that you're going to get rather than purchasing things, this thing outright and, um, and, and going on that cheaper plan per month? Yeah, look, I think if you looked at uh, this versus the Galaxy S20, for example, you're going to see big improvements in the cameras that are on board. You'll probably have some benefits in the processing power and the and the memory inside the device. But, you know, at 749, you're getting a device here with 128 gigs of storage. Yes, it's not a 5G handset in this variant. However, you've still got four cameras on the back. You've still got a very good camera on the front as well. And it's an all screen um, display on the front too. So you haven't got any buttons. And I hate to bring up the Apple in the room, but you know, you've got the iPhone SE, the 2020 edition at the exact same price. And now we have Apple and Samsung competing in a mid range level, which we didn't have before. That's got to take sales away from the premium end of the market, right? It has to. I mean, the premium end is the bit that has been keeping the revenue increasing for phone companies while unit sales have stagnated. Now they're getting into a big blue in the mid-market. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, with COVID-19 and people becoming a little bit more cost conscious, uh, the mid-range market is probably the hottest place that we're going to see play out in 2020. We'll always have those flagship phones. I think that's important to keep the innovation bar moving. But for most Mm. of us who are looking just to get a new smartphone that does most of the things that we do want it to do, uh, that $700 price point is going to come very hot. And we can see a lot of people gravitating towards the iPhone SE already. So having Samsung come out swinging with this device that you know actually looks like a new phone, whereas the iPhone SE looks like an iPhone 8 of many years ago, you can see why this is going to be a hot place to be playing in. It's interesting, right? Is there anything spec-wise not on this that you're actually going to need? I mean, I get the... I get the you know, no 5G and it's nice to have that so you can grow into that network if you choose to. And But I mean, have they, you know, dropped wireless charging, for example, or, or fast cable charging, those kinds of things? Is there any of those things not here that you really want? Yeah, you'll probably notice some very small things. And, and a lot of people who maybe hadn't had those features before won't even know that it's missing because it wasn't yeah. there before. Um, they, they have kept the three and a half mil headphone jack on the device, which is interesting oh, to see. Uh, but you're right, there are some things. If you look at the, at the wireless standards that it supports, or if you look at how much memory it's got, you can start to see where they've saved some money. Uh, but you know, for the average punter, I'll be very surprised if they pick up this device and start noticing those flaws from the beginning. Uh, It's only when you put the two side by side that you may actually notice the differences. But when you've got one device in your hand, I think you'd be pretty happy with it. Samsung Galaxy A71, it's the model has a million, there's literally a million different models of A series. This is their $749 option. It is available now. Check it out uh, at all good consumer electronic stores, as they say. 
Jeff Quattromani, tech expert. Thanks for joining us again today. Thank you, Charlie. From phones to TVs and even sound systems, Samsung know how to make high quality products that pack quite a punch. Samsung's laptop, the Samsung Galaxy Book S, is the latest product in the range and it doesn't disappoint. The new Galaxy Book S comes equipped with a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor that's designed to manage your workflow and is streamlined for mobility. With a reliable battery that can give you up to 25 hours of video playback from a single charge, it gives you the ability to work on the go for as long as you need. As a bonus, it even has 4G connectivity for when Wi-Fi is unavailable. Power up your device and log on with just one touch as they've merged the power button with the fingerprint sensor. Combined with the lightweight construction that puts the laptop at less than one kilogram of weight, the 13-inch display is a truly portable workstation. With 8 gigabytes of RAM, dual multifunction USB-C ports and 256 gigabytes of storage, it has all the essentials you need in a trusty portable device. Well, let's look at home security. This week I've got with me the Arlo Pro 3. This is the floodlight camera that they have just released. Now, let's open it up and take a look. The first thing you notice about this camera, um, once, once you start having a look at it, is the fact that Arlo is a maker of an ecosystem. They're not just a maker of individual cameras, right? So this one, um, you've got your, I'm gonna leave the plastic on here, okay, because I'm, I'm um, in fact, you know what? We'll take we'll take it off as we're doing. Um, you got your Arlo uh, Pro Three camera at the start here, and then you've got this wide area uh, floodlight, uh, so that you can uh, obviously light up the area of the of the backyard or front yard or wherever it is. Then inside, you've got um, with this this large area here for placing in the the lithium ion battery that goes in the back, and then sits in there nice and snug. Now, it's a really nice design. Uh, that's the first thing you, you notice. The other thing they've done with it is it's wireless. So it because it's powered, you can obviously have it, have it uh, as a wireless solution for your home. Um, you take the bracket, screw it anywhere you want, and as long as it's within your Wi-Fi range, and it can talk obviously to the, to the Arlo base station as well, you can um, have this set up and acting as a security camera with a light solution for your home too. So very interesting piece of technology from the guys at Arlo. This is their first floodlight camera that they've brought out. Um, and floodlight cameras are obviously getting very popular because um, lighting the area where you're filming is just as important these days as recording it. And once you've got a light solution for that particular area, it means that you can, um, you can get the benefit of the of the area being lit for you. You don't have to rely so much on the night vision camera capturing technology. So you can stick a light basically anywhere you want um, and it will record it too, as long as you're within that Wi-Fi range. So you might need to have a bit of a play around with your home Wi-Fi network. Um, and obviously it talks back to the, the Arlo base station as well. What they're doing with this is the three month free um, extra cloud um, promotion. So what? So Arlo's got their um, with the Arlo Pro three and, and upward technology. They've got they don't give you free cloud storage. You have to pay for any of your cloud storage, but um, they give you much more than cloud storage. So facial ID and recognition and 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 package identification of a package has been dropped at your house, for example. All those kinds of things are built into that. And what? Um, they're doing is they're giving you a three month period to actually try it out and, and give it a go and see whether you like it. You can cancel it off over that and store the vision that this is recording on the, um, on the Arlo um, home, home station that they've got um, instead of the cloud. You don't have to put it to the cloud, but most of us do. So this is the Arlo Pro 3 floodlight camera. It is just rolling out to stores at the moment. A uh, brand new floodlight camera in the market um, worth having a look at.
Libby sent through a tech question this week. She has a Sanyo reel-to-reel audio player. Uh, this one can go straight to a museum once you're finished with it, Libby. Um, and you want to make sure that you can continue to listen to the audio off the reel-to-reel on more modern format devices like smartphones and tablets. Um, yes, you can, um, but you have to real-time play all that audio off the reel uh, into the uh, line-in port on a PC, or you can get a USB uh, adapter. So you plug the two stereo ports on the back of the reel-to-reel, the left and the right audio, and you play uh, those into the USB port onto your computer, and you'll be able to record your audio in real time, title it, archive it, that kind of stuff. Just look at the back of your device, but there are plenty of those kinds of solutions out there on eBay, for example. Uh, music stores can help you there as well, um, and you can save all that ancient audio that, uh, in this case, was your dad's. So yeah, most certainly you can keep all of that. Uh, Margaret sent through a question. Thank you for your email, Margaret. Alcatel 3L, saw it last week. Went to went to purchase it from Vodafone stores because it's not available online yet. Uh, couldn't find one. Okay, we checked with Alcatel, and this handset is it's it sometimes takes a few days to get into all stores because of stock movements and that kind of stuff. I'm told this weekend most certainly the Alcatel 3L will be in Vodafone stores, so maybe give them a call on Saturday morning. Uh, thank you for all of your questions and comments. Plenty of questions and comments about the. Uh, Sonos soundbar that we did last week as well. Many of you loved it. Some of you said it was a bit expensive. Either way, leave your opinions. Uh, we'll get to them on next week's show. <laughs> Tuning in again, and look, thank you for your continued support of this live show that we do each week here on a Thursday. Uh, viewership has been going up very, very nicely. We thank you very, very much for your support, and that helps us to organize more competitions and giveaways and future guests that you want to hear from as well. If you have any suggestions on topics or segments or guests that you want to hear from in the future, make sure you let us know. Cybershack.com.au is our website address. Of course, we're on Facebook and YouTube as well. We'll catch you next week.